Hey hey guys, thanks so much for being here today. I know that it is not the best weather to be out, but it's a nice day to be inside talking about books. Um, Thank you so much to Diane for being here with us today. Can we give her a round of applause? So as Cynthia just mentioned, we are here today to talk about Diane's new book, My Family Divided, which was a adaptation of your 2016 memoir, In the Country We Love. Um, First, can you just tell us a little bit about what you kind of talk about in the memoir and why you chose to rewrite it for younger readers? Sure. Um, Hello. Uh, Thank you guys for being here. This is so beautiful uh, to look at into a crowd and, and, and to see people here in support of a book that is so special to me that that carries such an important message. Um, And I just remember my my first uh, book signing, or my my first book launch, and it was like half of you, so that means we've been doing some work. (laughs) And um, that means that the message um, has has, uh, spread, and I'm just so happy to be here with you today uh, in New York. So, um, so the book is about my, my story. Um, I don't know if those of you who have read uh, In the Country We Love. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, you girl, you liked it. Yeah, how many of you guys good. have read it? So happy about that. Um, so th- this is just an adaptation of that. So it's, it's my same story. Uh, it's just adapted to uh, middle school schoolers. It's a middle grade read. And the reason why we did this, well, I've always had... Um, the desire to bring my story to younger audiences. I mean, first of all, I didn't even think that I would bring my story to an audience, period. Um, I, and, and I was saying this earlier, I always thought that my story was going to be told at some point when I was older, much older, um, like really old. <laughs> Uh, because and I was and the only reason at the time when I thought about my story being interesting enough to be a book is just because it was just that it was because damn I have a lot of crazy stories that I can make into a book but I never thought I mean I guess when I was thinking about it um, that my story uh, that I was going to tell my story to serve a larger purpose and and that was to share a story that kids like me, that grew up like me, could relate to. And families that grew up like mine could relate to. And even families who didn't grow up like mine and kids who didn't grow up like me maybe could understand. Um, and in my, in my talks, um, so in the last year, I have uh, gone to many different universities and I've, I've uh, I've had a chance to talk to many different educators and people um, in schools and studying different things. Oh, hey, you know, my like manager, my agent, everybody's here. Hey, guys, they're my family. Um, I've I've had a chance to 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 speak to them one on one, and I've had a chance to learn that this book is really important, and it is really. Uh, impacting lives, and that there is a huge need for the story to be told to younger audiences. Um, I mean, I've had teachers come up to me and say, you know, some of my kids chose this for a book report, and it was not, uh, you know, this was like middle school and or even fifth grade, and and they chose this book to do a book report on. I mean, that was mind-blowing to me, especially as a person who never considered herself um, much of an academic and to know that this was um, inspiring kids of all ages, just it, it really motivated me um, to, to, to tell this story uh, for a younger audience. And, and so that's why we're here today. And I'm just so glad that I've had such an amazing community. And that includes you guys who read my story and have supported my story and have listened and have reached out and said, this story means a lot to me. This story means a lot to my little sister. This story means a lot to my neighbor. This story means a lot to my mother. I gave it to her in Spanish. That, all of that has made this book possible today and hopefully uh, will inspire many other stories to come, hopefully from you guys. Yeah, so in, 
Sorry, guys, I'm getting over a summer cold. I'm really upset about it. Um, so in rewriting this book for kids, did you um, ever think about maybe censoring some of the stuff that was in the original memoir? Um, I mean, you definitely talk about self-harm, about depression, mm -hmm. about, you know, substance abuse. Um, was that sort of a conversation that you had with yourself? And ultimately, what did you decide to do? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't believe in censoring. I mean, I, my parents never believed in censoring me. <laughs> I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. I was like, I don't need to know about this, guys. Thanks very much. Um, but... I I think that they didn't believe in censoring me. However, there was there was a huge like component missing, and that was the education portion of it. So I believe that if we educate our children early on on a subject matter that is impacting so many people, then the better off as a society we will be. I wish that I could have read a book like this in middle school or even younger to just understand what the system looked like, how it was affecting me and my family and others, and maybe that could have changed some things. Maybe that could have answered some questions as to how I was feeling. I had so many different emotions growing up and I couldn't identify any of them. Why was I angry? Why was I feeling sad? Why was I feeling nostalgic? Why was I feeling like I didn't belong? Um, and all of this stuff could have, uh, could have been answered in a book or, or reading a story that I could relate to. Um, so I just, I, I, don't, I, I think it's important more, more than ever now uh, to teach our children early on. I, I believe so much in education and how that is so important and, and how that's what we need really to create an empathetic and just society. And that is what really we're looking for. And I feel like that's really what has been so blatantly missing. And I think we're all starting to see that more now uh, with, with the current state of affairs. Yeah, and I mean, it's sort of ridiculous because the world didn't censor itself from you and it certainly doesn't censor itself from other children. Um, one of the things that has always really struck me about your story is, um, so your parents were deported when you were 14 years old and you got home, they were gone, and no one came to check on you. Like the US government was not involved with this at all after they had separated you from your family, which has always just been so shocking to me. What do you, um, what do you, what in your story, or what about the experience of being separated from your family do you want people to understand, especially in this day and age when this is such a big part of the news is the separation of families? Right. Well, well, here, I, what I've always tried to do with, with this book, not only was to under, try to understand myself, uh, what the separation of my family did to us, um, and try to help other people understand is the damage that this can cause a family. And no matter how many times I try to say, um, we're fine, <laughs> I've, you know, I've, I've been through therapy, or my parents have, we've all just, you know, accepted it, and now we've, we have a new form of, uh, of relating to each other, and, and we're all, we're fine now, we're dealing with it. It never gets easy. And I know a lot of people in my family are not over it. <laughs> As much as you would think that, I mean, that's including me, I'm not over it. Um, I know that I've been able to turn my life around and turn a very difficult situation into something very positive, like using my voice, like making sure that I am represented, making sure that I represent my community. These are all things that I really fought for, but I mean, this wasn't, I, I didn't set out for this. This wasn't easy by any means. I, I was very lucky. I was also very imaginative, and I was also very determined, and I, you know, I, I, I worked really hard, and those are all things that my family taught me. But all these things were also taught to my brother and to my niece and to other members of my family that have dealt with this, and it hasn't been the same outcome. And that's the message that I want to send: is that it is family separation causes so much harm. And it is of lifelong consequence. It doesn't just end 
the week that your family gets taken away, the year. This is, I've been dealing with this for 17 years and we're still going through the effects of a family separation. And it's, it's not good. It's harmful. And I don't think that as a country, we should be, uh, uh, we shouldn't just be so dismissive. And, and as a community, as the immigrant community, as a community that, that you guys are, um, uh, an educated community, a community that cares about others, need to understand that this is a huge issue that we all need to be involved in, that we all need to be proactive in changing. We need immigration reform. We need a path for citizenship. We need reunification of families. We need to try all of these things that have not been tried. And I think right now, more than ever, I think I, now our voices are starting to be heard because we are actually telling stories. We're sharing stories. We're actually seeing examples of, and, and of people who, are, who have been touched by this, who have been separated, who have been affected by this. Me being one, sure, but also those children that we see at the border. Also DACA students that are being threatened every day to be taken there, that their, their status is going to be taken away. We've already seen so many students that thought they had uh, uh, of protection from the government already be being stripped from those rights. Kids who came here when they were two and know no other country. So we are starting to see these things in our faces and now we can say, okay, how can we make this better? Certainly deporting 11 million people is not the answer. Certainly building a wall isn't really the answer. What are the things that we can try? What are the things that we can do as a community to help uh, uh, project this message? Um, and I think that we're, what we're starting to see now is that we can all be activists. We don't need to, to be a certain kind of person. We don't need to have a certain amount of money to help. We don't need to be a politician. Well, I mean, we, we certainly need to run for office. Uh, you know, as, as, as a community, as, as, as people who you normally don't see run for office, we, we're definitely seeing that we need more of people like us representing us, right? Um, and I, I forgot your question. Where, where was I going? I think that I forgot my question too, honestly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, since you came forward with your story, you have become sort of the face of this, you know, movement for immigration reform in a lot of ways. Um, did you do this expecting to become an activist? No. No, I, I just, I really, I mean, I don't know. I did it for, for a number of reasons. I was hella depressed. <laughs> I felt like um, I couldn't really advance in my life or my career if I didn't talk about something that mattered. I didn't feel like I could go on if I, if I didn't begin to be honest with myself and others and, and, and tell my truth. I also was inspired by young activists, young activists in college and in high school who were doing incredible things. Um, and kids who weren't even, you know, that attached to the, to the problem, if you will, or, that, or if this, you know, that this issue touched them so personally, they were doing in incredible things in, in raising awareness, in telling stories, in rallying, and um, help making sure that they were educating their communities. And I wanted to be a part of that. I really did. I, I, I saw myself as having a responsibility. It's like, I, especially, at the point where, where I was, you know, I had, I had just booked a show that I thought, um, I, I didn't really know what that meant, you know, to be in the public eye. I didn't really know what it meant to be interviewed about myself. So people asking you questions about who you are and all of a sudden like being faced with that question, who are you? What do you care about? What do you stand for? And so I, I wanted to answer those questions. And I wanted to be badass. I wanted to be out there fighting for what I believed in. I wanted to be out there with my other brothers and sisters who were doing so many good things in our community. And I wanted to be a part of that movement. So no, I didn't start out with, oh, I'm going to tell this story. And I just, I want to be, the, believe me, no one starts out in this business trying to be the face of deportation, OK? <laughs> All right. I don't, nobody wants to be looked at that way. You know, I still get bothered when, when 
People introduce me as like, Diane Guerrero, her parents were deported. Let's give her a round of applause. Something to be happy about. But I did want to put my story and my, and my life on the line and say, this is what I believe in. Why I believe in this is because this happened to me. Um, and I, and then, and then I, I just wanted to see what happened from there. Believe me, I don't really think things through um, when I do them. The, this whole book situation, I didn't think it through. I didn't think, I didn't think through any of, of this, but it has helped me in a way to like jumpstart me, right? To get me out there, to help me get over my fears because man, I was afraid to even raise my hand in class, you know? And <laughs> I was afraid to give an answer, even though the answer might've been right. I was afraid to try and I just wanted to try. I just wanted to give myself that opportunity. Um, and, and maybe at one point feel what, what it, felt to be understood, feel what it meant to be loved, feel connected. Um, and so, and so that's, and that's how I, how I, how I started. But now things have become a little clearer for me. Now it's not, I can't just be so willy nilly. Now it's not just, oh, I'll throw a rock, see what it hits. Um, it's stakes are high, man, and I've learned too much, and I've connected with so many incredible people, and that's what it is. So we have to understand. I'm sorry, I'm going off. I have, I am not here because I did it on my own. I am here because my community helped me. I am here because there are so many people that I that reached out to me, and I was able to reach back. And that is incredible. And like that message I think needs to carry us through. We need to understand that we are here with each other and together we can do some special, special things. And we can change lives. We can change our own lives by reaching out to our community, by understanding the power of community. And that's what I've experienced along the way. And I keep on, that is revealed time and time and again. It was revealed to me at, at, a, uh, at the march at the Families, at the Families Belong Together march. It was, re it was revealed at, at a march that I went to um, in San Diego recently that opened my eyes where I was with, with other um, uh, social activist uh, groups. I was with Black Lives Matter groups. I was with uh, people fighting for fighting to end mass incarceration. As families belong together isn't just people who are experiencing their families being separated because of deportation or because of immigration, uh, uh, because immigration policies, but people all over are being separated by, by their moms and dads being incarcerated, by kids being killed at school, Families are being separated by police brutality, by kids just walking down the street with a backpack and someone mistaking that backpack for being stolen and then them being sent to like a terrible prison where they get abused and then they kill them. There are so many consequences and there are so many families being separated. So we need to understand how that is all connected and how we have a responsibility to protect each other and ourselves, but more so each other. And how do we do that? We do that by participating. We tell that by sharing stories. We tell that by, by loving each other, by understanding each other, by if you see something wrong, have, if you have a problem with that, then you need to do something about that. We vote, we organize, what else? <laughs> no, I mean, to that point, but maybe a little bit more specific, um, your book is for kids. Oh, yes. And so when they read it, you know, what do you hope they do afterwards when they put down this book and they are, you know, inspired and they want to get out there and make change? What do you hope that these kids are doing? Or what would you, you know, compel them to do? Well, I mean, first is, is just, um, it's just realizing that, that they are special, that they are loved, that there's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, for kids who haven't experienced it, to say, wow, there are kids who are going through some crazy stuff. I would never think that, that that would be possible. I can't even imagine being taken away from my mommy and daddy. Maybe kids in middle school aren't saying mommy and daddy, but like from mom and dad. 
You know, like I can't imagine this. And for kids who are going through this uh, to, to say, wait, there is something that I can do for, for, on both sides, people who have gone through it and, 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 and haven't, to say, I, I, I can do something too. I want them to be inspired. Um, and, you know, the more, the more you know, the, the better off you will be. The better off you will be. I mean, and, and I think that we're, at, right now is a great time to realize how powerful we are. And I want that to start from a very young age. Because I can't even imagine like where I would be, y'all, if I would have realized that power earlier. Um, I mean, there's, of course, no regrets. But, um, you know, I mean, the sooner you can try and change things, the better. The sooner you realize something about yourself, if you can change something, the better, right? Um. Yeah, so I always really take issue with um, when people call immigration stories timely because it oh just God, feels to me very dismissive. These stories have always been really timely and important. Um, but I imagine that when you planned the Young Readers edition, you didn't anticipate that it was going to come out no. during a time when family separation is on the news every single day. Mm -hmm. So how has that um, experience kind of informed this book release for you? And you know, do you think it's more important now than ever that people are reading this? Oh my goodness. I mean, I've, I feel like, I feel a lot more support, I have to say. And, um, you know, I work really hard every day on like, on keeping myself motivated and, and, and keeping that belief that what I'm doing is worth it, that what I'm doing matters. You know, with so many things going on, you wake up every day and you're just like, oh, what did this dude do again? Like, what, what is happening with our country? Wait, how many people hate us now? What, what's happening? Um, you know, how, how, uh, there's, so, there's so much going on and it's so hard to believe that what you're doing is making a difference. And I go, and I'm, and I'm going through that every day. And with this book, um, be because I guess my experience with my experience with my first book was a positive one, but it did take some time to get there. And it was really hard to have a conversation when people are looking at you and they really don't understand where you're coming from. And I feel like this time around, because my book has been out and because unfortunately uh, this is happening, it's time for you to wake up, dude. I do that all the time. It's, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's like, mm, sorry. <laughs> um, but I get distracted. That's why I commented on it. I have ADD. I don't know if you guys read that in the book. Um, but at this time, I'm, I just feel more, just more motivated than ever. And I was feeling like, oh, Who's going to read, you know, every time I do this to myself, who's going to read this? Or like, who's, you know, here are we going to, here we go again. I, you know, always like thinking about what conservatives are, are going to say is, is stupid, you know. I spent so much of my time thinking and being worried about people telling me that I cared too much or that I was too sensitive or too emotional about issues. So I'm done with that. I'm done with that. <laughs> right? I'm sorry, too sensitive about human beings? It's who we are. <laughs> That's what this is all about. Um, and, and so, so now I just, I just feel, I feel really motivated. I've, I've had so much support. And yes, because, because this is going on at the border and these children, and it's, it's so visible to see the trauma that these children are going through, it has made me so angry. And, and it, all it has done has pushed me to want to talk about this more, to show up more, um, to understand and be thankful for my privilege, right? Because even though I have gone through this, I know I have not gone through half of of the things that these kids are experiencing. So that, 
it really has checked me too to say, damn, what are the things that I have to be grateful for and understand that I have that so many people do not have? Even though I struggle every day, even though I do have this trauma, I have to check my privilege, which makes me feel totally okay with being like, check your privilege, sir. <laughs> or ma'am. <laughs> but mostly, sir. Um, and, and so that, that has been very positive, even though it's a negative time. Yeah, and I feel like right now, it just is such an overwhelming time to exist in the world, just by nature of everything that is happening. Um, what do you do? I mean, do you feel overwhelmed at all by the new cycle? And what do you do? I mean, I'm sure you do. Look yes. at me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to assume, but and and what do you do, and what do you do when you're feeling overwhelmed? And how do you kind of try to channel that back into anger and into purpose and into hope? Um. I think I'm still learning how to be okay with shutting down and be okay with saying, okay, I need to take a break or I need to like take a minute or let me channel this into something positive. That takes work. That takes work every day. And what I've learned is that, and this is from coming from people who are out there working it every day. I mean, like people to be admired who aren't having these book talks and a release of books and being on social media and stuff like that. These are people who are out there every day who I give thanks to, uh, 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 who, uh, who I just have incredible um, uh, admiration for. These people are telling me, dude, it's okay to take a second. It's okay to shut off for a day or two or a week. It's okay not to show up to every rally it's okay not to donate every time there is something, you know? As long as you are there, as long as you do show up when you can, that's all you can do and that's all is expected. You know, I think sometimes we get so overwhelmed with everything that's going on and because we can't be there every single time because we have our own mental health issues and our own families to take care of and all these projects that we have to finish and all these deadlines and, and even, you know, even going to get a pedicure is, is, a, is a thing. You know, I don't want to re reduce it to that, but even self-care is hard. And so we want to get to all of these things. We want to make ourselves happy and we want to make money and we want to take care of our families and each other. But sometimes it's okay to just take a second. You don't have to be there every day, but you have to be there. You have to be there here and here. And so that should keep you motivated because when you can help, that means the world. And it does help and it does make a difference. It, it does matter. You know, it, when it matters, it matters because you are paying attention to when local elections are happening. It means that you're paying attention when we have a huge election happening November 6th. It means that we are supporting uh, people who are representing our values, get, get to where they need to get to, that get to office that we're supporting them, that we're, that we're knocking on doors with them, or that we're even aware to say, hey, we don't have enough people who are thinking like us making these decisions. So what can we do to organize so we can get more of these people there? Or maybe I can do this, right? I don't know how to finish sentences, so just that's just me. <laughs> I didn't do very well in school. Now, um, I don't know if anybody in this room or if you have read an essay in 40 Questions by Valeria Luzelli. She's um, a Mexican immigrant to the United States, and she wrote this 100-page book about um, undocumented refugee children in the United States. She was a translator in the courts. It's a really beautiful book, really quick read. You should definitely pick it up here downstairs if, um, if, if you want, if you want to learn more about immigration. Um, but at the end of the book, she talks about how she was, was a professor for these college students and she decided to focus her curriculum on talking about immigration problem. And, you know, somewhere around, you know, like 60% of the way into the, into the semester, the students were just like, we can't talk about this anymore, we have to do something. And they organized by themselves and they, you know, started this like community program in their, um, in their town. And I always think about that, about how um, 
you know, stories are so important, and then at a certain point, you have to take those stories and do something with them. Um, and so I guess kind of at what point did you realize that sharing your story was enough, that you had to switch that around and actually start doing something as well? That, oh, like aside from sharing my story? Um, well, I've never, th I've, I've, I never thought that was enough, you know? Um, and nothing is ever enough, but I think that we can, we can certainly take from those initiatives and say, okay, this is how far, this is how much I've been able to give. How much more can I give? And just and 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 keep trying and keep experimenting. I still don't think I'm doing enough, girl. You know, I I, I call my manager every day, like just being like, I I I want to do this, but I and I want to also do this, but now if I want to get here, that means I have to not make this engagement, or that means I can't protest here, and then now I feel terrible, and oh my goodness, I I missed posting about this, or um, I you know I didn't I didn't. I, I didn't go to the border. I chose to go to DC and I didn't go to the border instead. It's like, you know, my, my plan, this is, this is a continued fight, you know, and wherever you decide to begin, that is your choice. I chose to tell my story to start this. I always knew that I wanted to be a part of the conversation. I wanted to be a part of the movement. This isn't just me doing this, y ya se acabo. This is just, this is me starting out with something and hoping, hoping along the way that I can do more. I think about my work as an actor as a form of, of revolution. Yeah, I really think that stories are activation. No, no, no. They're me being out there is huge. Me being a person, a woman of color, is huge, right? I like claps, I always say my <laughs> things. Um, but no, and I never really thought about this because I would always get down on myself. It's like, what am I gonna do, just share my story? And believe me, people on Twitter are mean as fuck. And they're just like, oh, you shared your little story, now what do you do? You don't do this, you're not a real activist. You know, I get stuff like that all the time. And it's just like, yo, what do you mean I'm not a real activist, kid? I'm out there every day trying to, trying to, be, uh, trying to be seen. We as a people are constantly trying to be shut down, silenced, trying to be hid. Back of the kitchen, back of the line back, you know, over the border, back to where you came from, back to this, back to that. You're not American enough, you're not Latino enough. No, we're not gonna share your stories, we're not gonna tell your stories, we're not even gonna represent you on television. Also, we're gonna misrepresent you on television when we do show you. So, that, realizing that was important. Because not only did it help me say, okay, I'm staying in this fight, because believe me, as, a, as an actor of color, in this business, it's really tough to get in there. And so as long as I'm here, as long as I am continue show my showing face, as, as long as I continue going to the auditions, continue trying to write stories, getting together with, with other people who want to tell these stories, that is huge. So I won't, I won't discount that um, as, as something that is, that is powerful as well. I know I'm like, sounds like I'm patting myself on the back, but I had to realize that so that I can continue this journey. Because if I didn't, I, you know, there's so many times that I want to give up. Um, because, it, it, and, and it allows me, it allows me to continue doing this work. Being out there, being present, being seen allows me to continue doing this work that I'm so passionate about. Um, so yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it is important. I always, joke but it's not really a joke that we were the only family who continued to watch the tv show dark angel um because it starred jessica alba and she was like the only mexican on tv at that time mm -hmm. like we were a strictly christina aguilera family because 
Christina was Latina and Britney Spears wasn't. Um, <laughs> but like, it's true. Like, you see yourself reflected so little in media, in shows, in books, that even the fact of the matter that there's a brown girl on this cover is revolutionary. It's not even so much, I mean, it's powerful that it's an immigration story, but it's also powerful that it's the story of a Colombian girl. Right. And I mean, it's just as really wild to me. Um, I mean, I guess it isn't because of the state of the United States, but we are such a force. Like Latinos are making America and but we deserve to be on we, more book covers. Absolutely, we, yeah. do, we deserve to be out there too, you know what I'm saying? Especially if, if our community is so large and is contributing so much to our economy and to the way things work. And I hate to reduce our people to a number, but damn, if these people wanna talk about numbers, let's talk about numbers then, you know? Let's talk about what makes this country great. It's all of us, regardless of color, regardless of where we came from, regardless of where your parents came from. Let's not forget our history, okay? That's important. We like to forget our history. It's like that little thing called history. How did this, how was this country made? It was made by all of us. Why is this country so great? It's because all of us are here. Um, anyway, <laughs> that's how I end every sentence, so what? Um, so in, in both of the, the memoir and the Young Readers edition, they're both memoirs, um, you talk about your niece, Erica, um, and of course your brother was also um, deported, and so Erica also is separated from her dad. Yeah. Um, you know, is she planning on, I don't know, how, how old is she now? She's 24 now. She's 24? Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. oh, so she's not a kid anymore. Oh. <laughs> no, but you know, all of us really who were affected by this have this sort of like stunted growth included i mean certainly me and height um but even my brother who is my brother is 40 is will be 42 um and and i'm 32 and my niece is eight years younger than than me so she's 24 but we all sort of like were st stuck and, um, and really uh, affected by this. And so she's 24 now, but she's having to start all over. So what has been your family's response to both of these books and to you sharing your story? Oh, well, that has been, I mean, I, I, have a, I don't have the perfect relationship with my parents, as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't great to begin with, you know, we always, I, I mean, you're growing up scared, you're growing, you know, you're fighting all the time because of money, because you're afraid of deportation, you know, because you're, you're gonna be left alone, because you're gonna take away, you're gonna be taken away. All of these things are, are really stressful in a family and create a lot, of, a lot of anxiety. So it doesn't really foster a healthy relationship. And so we've had issues and we still continue to have them. But the one thing um, that I, have you know that that I think has has been sort of a light in all of this is that I don't think if I ever talked about this like when I I remember my parents couldn't even talk about it they were so ashamed I mean obviously me too we we couldn't we couldn't talk about it and so we couldn't talk about this to other people we couldn't talk about it with each other. And that was really tough on our relationship. Like it would just be, we would just be staring at each other, fuming, angry, sad, desperate to say something, desperate to say the right thing, but everything we would say to each other was wrong. Certainly what they were saying to me was wrong as, as a teenager left behind, as an American, as, as a person who was struggling with her identity. Everything they said to me was wrong. Everything they did was bad. And so sharing my story in this way um, has really changed things for the better. Um, I think it has really redeemed our family. Not, not to the, I, I don't know how people see us in, our, in the community we had or that we have, but I know that with us, we can look at each other and say, this happened. And even though we're not together, and this is hard every day, we really appreciate that you told this story and we couldn't have asked for more than for you to 
to use your, your voice and your talents in this way. And that has been really great for me. And that's all I, that's all I ever wanted. I, all I ever wanted was to make my family proud in this way. You know, everything else, like, I mean, yes, acting and, you know, being in a, in a space where my family and I never saw ourselves in. Maybe more than they saw, maybe they like had hope that they saw me in that space, but in a place where we don't normally get to as, as, a, as people who have gone through an experience like this. Um, I had always wanted for them to see me in this way, as a, as a chingona, as some Mexicans, some Mexicans would say, you know what I mean? That's a new thing I learned too, right? So I'm Colombian, I don't know, I didn't know anything about a chingona, what a chingona was. Um, but I really wanted to be seen by them in this way, to, that uh, una berraca is what Colombians would say, like a go-getter, a strong woman, a person who stands by her convictions and a person who fights for her family. And so that has been really cool. Awesome. Um, well, I definitely agree that you're chingona. <laughs> and I'm going to open the floor up to some audience questions. Um, so I don't know how you guys are going to do it with the microphone. Okay. We've got Cynthia coming. So do we have any questions for Diane? Hi, Dan. Hi. Um, I'm sure mental health is a big issue and it's a journey that you're overcoming and it's been a journey that a lot of immigrant children are overcoming. And um, I think there's so many bars and hills that we have to overcome whether it be being able to open up about it to our family and being understood to the professionals who we can seek out to help it, plus also being open to actually help, like going out for those services. Can you talk about like the journey and what you could tell us young generation on seeking mental health help, um, especially through your path and your journey? Thank you. Thank you for that awesome question um, and for that statement, dude, you good. Um, I think it's so important for our communities to realize how important mental health is and how much, how detrimental it is for our development and our, and our success, really. Um, so what, what I would hope is that, I, I, like, first of all, as, as a nation, we don't really value mental health, right? Imagine, and we know this, it, but in as as members of, so, or some of you know this as members of, of immigrant communities and as uh, and as part of maybe lower income communities or Latino communities, um, or Black and black, Brown communities, is that mental health is considered a luxury, right? It's not something you know. I remember when I first went. I mean, my mom totally feels certainly just so different about mental health now. I mean, she's just like, okay, I need therapy. Um, but before, she, I I remember telling her I was unhappy. And she just could not get that. She was like, you better put on your shoes and buck up because there's nothing to be unhappy about. You are a US citizen. You have the right to be here. And you go to a school that you want to go to. And that is that. And you have food on the table. And that is that. And so I mean, I consider my parents pretty progressive. And my mom was telling me this. So I, you know, and this is because we have, there is little education on mental health and the importance of it. So what I would hope is that us as a community can get together and continue sending that message of how important mental health is and how, how important it is to our success and to our livelihood. Uh, and, and, and hopefully change will come from, from there. But but that, would, that also starts with us ourselves getting the help that we need so that we know how, how it can change lives. And, and I go through, I mean, I, 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 I still haven't found, I don't think I've ever said this, but I still haven't found a therapist that, that I can totally jive with, that totally gets me, that I am totally comfortable with. Um, and I'm still looking. 
But that is that is that is something that you have to be proactive about. I sometimes will say, "Well, this didn't work out. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> it's really fine." <laughs> and then and then I you know um you know everything's going well. Work is going well. You know relationship with your significant other is going well. And you just got a new puppy. Things that you know that puppy's cool. Everything is going well. And then something will happen that can change all that. And sometimes we don't have those tools. And it hits me like a ton of bricks every single time. And it makes me realize how important that is. So you can never stop looking. Just because something didn't work out with your first person, the first person that you, or maybe a group. Maybe there's different things that you need to do. But you have to keep on looking. Don't give up on that. Everyone deserves that service. Everyone deserves that self-care. I know I'm still looking, so I'm not perfect. I'm not sitting here talking about, I have a great therapist and everything is great. No, I haven't found, my last therapist fell off the wagon. And that's tough. What do you do with that? You're like, damn, who are, these are my, the professionals like, that are supposed to help me? No one's sane. You just have to keep on looking. You have to keep on doing that work. Anyway, that's all I have to say about that. All right, any other questions? Looks like we've got one right here. Hi. Um, so uh, you mentioned earlier kind of the difficulty of being a woman, a woman of color in the entertainment industry. I've attended a few panels at the Sundance Film Festival that had uh, panelists or Latino panelists yeah. that were different directors and screenwriters. And they shared a lot of their stories about, you know, kind of the difficulty, like how difficult it can be within Hollywood and kind of stepping into that circle. And so I was just curious to ask you, you know, what you know, in difficult times or like difficult scenarios like that where it's kind of hard to put your foot in the door, like what is something that has inspired you or what have you looked up to to help you within those times that maybe it is difficult? Um, well, certainly having a, a strong uh, group of people around you, a good community around you, when, when you know when you when you are feeling weak and you're feeling like you can't go on anymore and you want to like throw in the towel, those people will tell you, guess what? You are, you you do have the strength to go on. You know you do have that power. You are smart. You are worthy. You can do this. You are you are meant for this space. And so you need that. But also. Just to know that you deserve the right to be here. And things are difficult, yes. But let's not, let's not let that deter us. And that, the way I do that is just by not having any expectations about anything. I didn't even know what the Strand book, the book store was. I honestly thought this was at the Strand Theater. That's part of me not having any expectations for anything. <laughs> That's not necessarily the way everyone should go. <coughs> but what I'm saying is, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't get, I don't get, and this is what I've learned along the way because before Orange is the New Black, all I've ever needed was just a sign that things are possible. And every single time that things are hard and you just muster up the strength to try one more time to give it your all one more time, something does happen. Whether it is getting the job, whatever, or, or, or something you know, great happens in your relationship, or maybe you get a job that, is, that you needed for, for, you know, for money on something else, or maybe you finish writing a, a poem that you, know, you wanted to write, or maybe you finish a story, it doesn't matter. Every time you give that last push, something always happens. And that's just been my experience that there's always something positive that happens when I do put it, like put my all in at the, at the time where I'm like, okay, I just have to keep pushing. Um, so I would just say that this is, this is something that, you know, you have to work at. And as a Latina, as a, as a woman of color in this industry, things are, things are what they are. And look, we're a resilient people. You gotta get to work. That's all, you know, when you were born, people just gave you a little hammer and just like, there you go, figure it out. And that's just, you know, and some of us have families that support us, some of it, and we just have to think about all the gifts that we have and, and use those to support ourselves, use those tools, be smart with them. And also, when, when, you, have, when you have those tools, help share with others. 
And so that w that's why, I mean, look, I'm doing this for me too. I want these doors to open for me too. But I'm also doing it for my community. I also have a bigger, uh, just a larger vision. Yes, because I care about people, but because I just know that those are my cards. And it's just like, I'm not gonna get any further without doing this work. And that's just the way it is. Um, so I, what I've been seeing a lot from people in the industry is getting together, writing stories together. You know, we, we've never really been seen as writers. How many writers do you see that are Latinos, that are like showrunners? Not, not that many. So, there, so it's, it's good to see, okay, now that we have enough confidence to go to school, to be interested in different things, to know that we have the power to change things, to know that we have um, a platform, that we have, the, that we, you know, are... That we are that we are deserving to be in in a space. Now we get to work and get you know look look beside you. Okay, what do you want to do? You want to get together? You want to write a story? This is what we have to do. This is what people are doing, and we see examples like that. And and I I like to comment on on Issa Rae, and I like to comment on 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 Donald Glover. I mean, these are people who have who maybe had had some tools. Didn't they didn't really see many examples, but you know what, let me try this out. These are examples now that we can, you know, look at and say, we can do this too. And now we have, you know, we have people like, um, oh my gosh, the showrunner from Vida. We, do we know? Please look that up. Um, Sarracho? Tania Sarracho? Anyway, so she is the showrunner of Vida, right? We have Shonda Rhimes, right? We have people like that. And so now we're seeing it's possible. And our stories, they, believe me, they're special. People want to hear them. And no one has heard your story. Just like no one has heard really, I mean, people have heard my story, but. <laughs> but I want to tell my story in, in different ways. I, I'm very long-winded, you guys, so please, someone stop me. <laughs> All right, well, I think Saracho. we have time for one more question. Oh my um, god, I'm sorry I did that to you. See someone in the back. This this. Yes, Hi. you. <laughs> um, Hi, Diane. Hi. Um, I'm 16 years old. I'm a high school student, so you know I can't vote. Um, so I was wondering, you know, your thoughts on the role that youth can play in activism, specifically immigration reform. I'm sorry. What? Um, I was wondering your thoughts on like the role that youth can play in activism, like today. That I, that I can play or that you can play? The youth, me, yeah. Oh, like the youth. I'm so sorry, that you. I was like, I just spent 45 minutes telling you <laughs> what I'm trying to do. Um, oh my goodness, well, first of all, you guys are so powerful. I know, I mean, this is like every politician's like, you kids are the future. That's not how I'm saying this. Like, first of all, People who inspired me to even do this work were high school students and, and, and students going into college. Like, you guys have so much power. You have the power, first of all, to inform yourselves because you are the ones who are going to be making decisions. Believe me, 18 ain't so far away, boo. <laughs> Just like 32 is literally on Saturday for me. <laughs> so you're not far off. What you can start doing is join, you know, organize, organize. Organize, deliver the messages that you want to deliver, all of that. I mean, look, there's so many people who can't vote. There are so many people who can't vote in this country because their voting rights have been stripped away. Those people are most of communities of color, people in incarcerated, people who have committed federal offenses who cannot vote now, immigrants, DACA students. And a lot of these people are organizing and they're looking at their family members and they're looking at their communities and they're looking at their friends and they're being like, vote for us, vote for me, vote for our children. So what you can do is look, go right up to a person and say, please vote for me. Please vote for me. Vote for our country, right? I mean, you guys are affected the most. That's all. All right, well, maybe you should consider running for office. I'd vote for you after this. No, please. <laughs> no. No, please stop it. We have come I have too to many. I have too many jobs already, okay? <laughs> Good. All right, well, we've come to the end of our hour here, but thank you so much thank for you. being here and for sharing so many inspiring words with us. I know that I am feeling super motivated to get out there and do something. I don't know how you guys feel. Yeah.
Thank you so much for coming. Really means the world to me. I just know that if I can do it, okay, you can certainly do it, okay. And I'm not. not I'm not giving. You, I'm not giving myself too much credit, okay. I, I had a really hard time, <laughs> okay.